Hello, my fellow mods, and welcome to The Perspective. I'm your host, John O'Neill, and in association with DC Hillier and MCM Daily, we've just had our first international conversation through different time zones, a Saturday night party for us in North America, and a Sunday morning chat for this radio and television personality who has continued to elevate his early fame in a comedy duo by focusing on his passion in architecture and design. This guest has helped to save buildings, hosted live shows at the Sydney Opera House, has created acclaimed television about the stories of homes and neighborhoods, and has thoroughly educated us about modernist design and architecture in Australia. We welcome you into this conversation between DC, Greg, and myself with the man many of you know as Rosso, Tim Ross. Ah, uh, there we go. Beautiful. You can tell we're in the, the honeymoon phase of this podcast and we all bought, you know, sure matching microphones and <laughs> we're, we're up in our gear. What's good. I did a lot of, spent a lot of time being a professional broadcaster, but yeah. technically I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, Summer Breeze, I, I, I mean, you know, went through and, and listened to the episode you have up. What a cool, you know, satirical spin on on a radio broadcast. Did you have like some of that audio and and some of those clips, uh, you know, loaded everywhere so you could you could play them? I Is that like I, a library? No. So what happened was I do a, a a Christmas Day show on on we've got this station over here called Double J, which um, I w worked at the, its more junior partner. It's a government funded sure. youth youth radio station. Oh, and cool. I, I used to do the drive show uh, there when I was in my, in my 20s. And uh, the audience is a little older now, so they all go to Double J, which is a digital station. And for five or six years, I've been doing a, a Christmas Day show, which is great. Just play lots of great tunes, have a couple of good yeah. tunes. And then I couldn't do it this year or uh, last year because of COVID. Um, right. We just didn't have the resources. So I wanted to do something similar for people who couldn't listen. And, of course, you can't play music on a podcast right. Oh, right. and, and, right. and to, the licensing. The yeah. licensing. So to get around being able to play music on the podcast, we did versions of our cover versions ourselves to play our yeah. own song. So that's that was, yeah. that's why we ended up doing, you know, cheesy covers, which it's is fun. Great. And, awesome. yeah. and, and I particularly really cracked up. I was in the car just like laughing out loud with the, the Billy Joel <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> little skit. <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys listen to it, DC Greg, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's just like we don't play Billy Joel. Like, yeah, I'm glad you enjoy people call it. Call it in and, and requesting you know not to have Billy Joel no, play. That's, I mean, that's like a hilarious. joke that I will I will never live down because I'm from Long Island. I live on yeah. Long Island. I'm currently probably 20 minutes from where Billy Joel grew up. Grew up. I hate Billy <laughs> yeah, Joel. I are. hate him. Yeah. I don't know if you guys like him, but I hate him. Uh, uh, I like pre 1982 Billy Joel. Oh, I'll admit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you get to DC. You I you know, would man, have a whatever. specific, uh, you know, oh, <laughs> part of the catalog. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I I really enjoyed that. We were just saying before too. It's funny to envision Christmas Day being, you know, at, at least for the three of us, being warm. Mm. <laughs> you know, I know that's I know that's not uh, unique to Australia, but. Um, you know, it would be snowy and, and we wouldn't be poolside barbecuing. <laughs> well, for many years, you know, um, we try and do all those traditional things like have roast meats and, um, you know, it'd be 45 degrees. What's that? hundred, hundred degrees. Sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then oh you've God. got, and you've got like the heat the, the oven going full bore, um, <laughs> and you're sitting there eating roast turkey with gravy. Um, it's <laughs> right. silly, but. That's what happened. That comes with a colonial past. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right, right. yeah. And as that's, a Canadian, that's, I can relate. a tradition. To that. Yeah. yeah. We are the colonies. Yeah. Now, right. Now. Well, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, the colonial aspect of Australia and, and design, DC, how, how did you put it exactly? Well, um, I, was there an, a bit of an insecurity there? It's almost like when you grow up in a Commonwealth country, or when I was born, it was called the Dominion of Canada, uh, British Dominion. And... Huh. I didn't and know. even today, it's still a constitutional monarchy. Um, that's the system of parliamentary government we have. But there's always sort of like this deference to the mother country. You will always be provincial. Sure. And I think there's sort of this pervasive notion that know your place almost. So don't take pride in your accomplishments. Huh. Be, hmm. be humble in your accomplishments. And because of that, 
you don't have people touting design or the architectural legacy of a nation, for instance. It's less these days, uh, but you grow up with this, this notion of what I like to call colonial shyness. Uh, sure. And I, sure. I wanted to ask you, Tim, for instance, when you first started discovering design and architecture uh, as, as an interest and passion, was it hard to get people on board as far as getting excited about these things, that, that these were important? Uh, these are even the everyday objects, whether it's something like a wine cooler, might right. be something important and interesting to the history of a country. Mm. Um, because these are the things that defined what people did. These are the places they lived. So, Tim, what defines for you things that make, too, you, archi yeah, Australian architecture unique and interesting and important, globally important? But also maybe a little, you know, a bit about that. Yeah, now. and also with that, for instance, yeah, it's important. So, how are people? Why aren't people more excited about it, or are they excited about it? Do you think they're getting more excited about it? I mean, you're certainly putting in the effort. I, th I think they are definitely getting more excited about it. But connecting people to architecture, the way that it, I see it, is that you, you, if you connect people with stories, or you connect people with memories. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's all, it's hiding in plain sight constantly, mm, you know. That's a good way to put it. Um, so we know that I suppose I think architecture, like all the arts, is that, that sometimes people have to allow themselves to love it um, mm. or, or more, to, more importantly to let themselves be moved by it. Mm. And I don't think, I, I often think people need to look up or open their eyes and when you can attach a story to a building, people will have a buy-in factor. Um, mm. and so I use nostalgia a lot. I use the sense of national pride a lot, um, yeah. to, to remind people that, um, architecture and gr being great designers in, in, in my country is, is part of our DNA. Um, and, mm. and, and our best architecture comes from our, its response to climate, its response to, um, you know, wh where we live, our, our landscape, um, and the colors of our natural bush. Um, sure. and so that's our take on, on modernism. So if there is a, if there's something that defines the modern movement, you can see similarities everywhere, but, uh, mm. how our architects, particularly in the 1950s and sixties and into the 1970s took modernism and they adapted it at using our, our local materials, um, blending it in with the landscape. Yeah. I was, I was curious if that was, you know, was that technology and innovation that was pushing the, the field to adapt to, you know, the weather or the climate or, or the surroundings? Yeah. So, um, so, we, you know, we had a post-war, um, you know, immigration boom. Um, people had to sure. live, people live, live somewhere. And we had this explosion of um, architect designed um, project homes in, in the suburbs all yep. across, all across the nation. And so what I suppose you call them track times. So, um, sure. uh, so we had our, nowhere else in the world did, did we, did they have, we had our best architects designing homes for everyday Australians. And so mm. that was a huge thing. And, yeah, um, unique. and suddenly, uh, architecture and design in that period of time was top of mind for people. Um, there, there was a middle class, a huge middle class, uh, people aspirational, um, and they started designing homes, um, nestled into the bush suburbs. And so they, sure. they reflect an, a national identity in a way that architecture had never done before. Or some of our, certainly some of our colonial architecture and some of these architects at the time looked to a, a sort of Australian sheds, um, a sort of farmhouse, um, typology, <laughs> um, sure. to, to create versions of that. Um, and then we saw it when and then the knock-on effect, the flow-on effect of that, which was seen internationally, was right. uh, was Glenn Merkett, our famous architect, who who reimagined a, a tin shed um, as a home, and then you know won the Pritzker Prize, and and um, that's a style of architecture that's been, I, I suppose, been been copied um, yeah. and inspired people all over the world, and 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 the flow-on effect of lots of those people growing up in interesting well-designed houses in the in the 50s 60s and 70s they bec especially now they become architects in their 40s and 50s who are at their peak they're, they're designing right. the best of our local architecture that's been informed by that experience of growing up in an interesting house mm -hmm. sure sure yeah my, i'd say much like it sounds like you know you and your neighborhood is that is that where it, it started? I feel like I heard that in an interview or uh, you know one of the the talks you gave. 
You know, like that, and the same thing, and, the, and it's the reason we're all sitting around, and it's the reason everyone will be listening to this right now. And it's this, sure. it's it's what I talk to everyone when I when I when I, when I'm able to tour overseas. It's the yeah. thing that unites us is that in some way there was always a house around the corner from us when we grew up, and we wanted to go inside that house, and invariably that house was a modernist home, and yeah. it was more exciting than our own. And it's the most simple of ways to point about this the pool of modernism in terms of this visceral romanticism of modernism. And that's what gets us. Yep. And, it, and for us, it's also uh, people of my generation, um, both with television that was made here and television was overseas. It was the architecture on TV when I was a kid. And yeah. because we live, because, you know, and we live in a provincial place, a lot of television we watch was on repeats. So as a kid in the seventies, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm watching TV that's 10 years old. You know, I'm watching TV that's 15 years old. Um, and so that has a huge formative effect on, 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 I had on the me. exact same experience. We were yeah. watching well, publicly made TV, one show called the beach combers where literally yeah, yeah, that, yeah. you saw the beach. Combers. <laughs> yeah. It's got that great theme song. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, it would be on repeat constantly. Yeah. And like 10 years after the show had ended, Wednesday evening at seven, you'll catch an episode of the Beachcombers. I would not have thought you'd know the theme to the Beachcombers. Well, is that, is that, is that a Canadian other... show or is that an Australian show? That's a Canadian show. Canadian, Canadian show? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The other one I love that we got out here, which from Canada was a, was a, a um, which I love the theme. I love television theme song, songs. <laughs> And there was a one called Seeing Things. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, seeing things, believing. Anyway, Google it, kids. But um, <laughs> yeah, I love it. Because <laughs> yeah. TV mean, shows don't have theme songs very rarely anymore. And no, I, mean, I know. You know they were one-minute the one, yeah. Yeah, one yeah. pop songs, they called them mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah. Music seems to be a pretty big part of, you know, your show, right, when you're touring Man About the House. I'm curious about, you know, number one, early on the process and in, in developing that by individual location, right? And, and trying to find that inspiration. And if if the content or the talk track or the narrative a little bit is, a, is uh, adapted to each place. But then also, you know, is that original music that you're, you're writing together, it sounds like with Kit, yeah. and, uh, and putting together sort of this variety show? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the idea about Man About the House goes back to that idea of places I wanted to go into. And um, yeah. it was in a pretty successful um, comedy duo in Australia. And, sure. uh, you know, we did a bunch of TV shows and toured live things. And I, and I really enjoyed doing that. But then I suppose I, I, I bought a modernist house. I've collected furniture my whole life. Um, and it's sort of the, a passion sort of spiralled out of control. And I saw, I start, <laughs> I'd always wanted to make documentaries on, on Australian modernism. And so, uh, so I thought, oh, there was this Rose Seidler house. It's a Harry Seidler home. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's one of the great modernist museums in the world. Mm. So I was talking to the people who run it and I said, I've got this idea for this show and I'm going to do some stand-up and tell some stories and um, we're going to do some music because it's played in bands with the best mate kit. And I didn't really know how it was going to work and no one really knew how it was going to work and it, and it took a while. <laughs> yeah to find the mixture of being able to talk about architecture and still tell funny stories and, mm -hmm. and not do yep. joke. Not, I don't do a lot of jokes about architects or architecture. Sure. Um, it's more about the idea I always thought was that I'd been to plenty of home tours, you know, uh, and I was like, God, imagine if we can go there and have a drink and see a show. Um, yeah. I always, it always surprised me at you'd go out to modernism week at Palm Springs and you'd be, you'd be going to see these talks in the shittiest motels, hotel, you know, <laughs> yeah. like we go, we go on this bad eighties Hilton. It's a, it's a terrible building. And that's where you spend the whole day. It's like, <laughs> right. it's all out there. Why don't right. we go and do a talk it's in the house? Convention center. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. a long way to go to, 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 to be in a Hilton. So, um, <laughs> that's true. So why so can't true. We, why I've can't seen we... some that have, I haven't been to modernism yeah. week. It's definitely a goal. Uh, I've seen some photos of people standing around a pool. Maybe it's getting a little bit better. Yeah, uh, I mean they have given talks. They, they have, have no, you're right. They have parties where you can go for an hour or so. But yeah, right. so well, why can't why can't I hang out in this house? Why can't I have a glass of wine and meet some right. new people and 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 create a new community? So we did that, and then yeah. and as time's gone on, I've been more comfortable to talk about architecture. And some sure. some some nights it'll be more, you know, a Saturday night where everyone's drinking. It's going to be a lot of traditional stand up, some fun songs. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, so we write, we do, you know, the odd, um, spirited 
cover and then we'll, we'll tell stories about, you know, sometimes we'll do a Springsteen song because, um, oh, God, I've had a mental plan for the drummer in this. Who's the drummer in the East Street Band? Uh, Max Weinberg. Thank yeah, you very Greg, much. Greg's yeah. got you. Bang. He's, he's, our, the, he's our resident music Greg, and audio Greg on, guy the, Greg on the buzzer. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, Max, we- like Max Weinberg out from, uh, he's out on tour and I'd seen, hmm. I'd seen him in, on, in concert. And then we got this call. We'd been singing Born to Run in the show because it was, a, it was I had a story about it. And then we get this call like Max Weinberg, he loves the Rose Seidler house. He's kind of, he's got Thursday night out. He's going to come out to your show. Whoa. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> Max Weinberg, he, does, he didn't write Born to Run, but he plays it for a living and we're going to have yeah, to right. sing it in front of him. Anyway, right. he didn't end up coming. Right. But um, <laughs> but then we got a call and they said, can you go and Nervous show him? for no reason. Can, no, can you show him the house? So we picked, I picked him up from uh, his hotel. Oh, cool. And, and, and drove him up to look at it. And then suddenly, you know, we were asking him every question he ever could. And then I, I detoured on the way back to show him this other sort of modernist neighborhood and he, that by then he yeah. was a bit bored and he went oh like can you just <laughs> can you just take me home now tim <laughs> right. he's like i, I do i do I, like the song i only like modernism this much yeah but... <laughs> I, I gotta go i gotta do the show but you know like i do right. that's one of the things you know like uh, i love about you know much it's much maligned i suppose isn't it the the social media but um that ability to connect with people all over the world who who, who share similar mm, yeah. similar interests is, is a beautiful thing it seems like you, you know, spanning a lot of your different projects that I've been able to look into, that's your vision to start, just like you described. And I'm curious, you know, when you bring this vision to a network or to places or individuals to, to help you get funding, you know, is, is do you find that easier than a project maybe that's dictated to you? Or are there just so many steps that you need to like bring that vision to life? Getting um, architecture on television anywhere, or certainly where I live, is one of the hardest things. And so, I, um, yeah. sure. the, the, the first one I did was a series called Streets of Your Town, which basically tells the story how Australia had some of the best domestic architecture in the world, and now we have some of the worst. How we went. <laughs> sure. And so it becomes down to... Yeah, I saw we, the uh, modernism to big mansions. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's, uh, it's um, smart. Yeah. So that was, I think, probably eight years um, of my life to get that up in different guises um and so you you know a lot of funding and then and then that did really well won a bunch of awards and uh you know lots of people watched it and um yeah you know it was was, i'm like trying to fuss with the iview app and watch everything Uh, in the united states and stuff (laughs) anyway if anyone's listening and want to watch any of my shows just send me an email hit me up through instagram and i'll send you a vimeo link it's really easy to do great um that's you know like it's it's not a big deal. I just I it's just impossible to put them up on YouTube because of rights. Yeah. Um. But you know, so it's really tricky. So, but and then I thought, you know, I've done this one. This is going to be great. You know, it's won awards. Yeah. Everyone's watched yep. it. And then I came up with this other idea called designing a legacy about mm. people who had who had grown grown up in architecturally significant homes. Sure. And, and we all have to say goodbye to our family home at some stage. But what if it, your house is a masterpiece? And the things that people mm. did to hold on to that family legacy. Right. Some, some people, you know, gave their ha- family homes away. Some people bought back their family homes. And so oh, this is a great idea. Wow. So I went out and I shot a bunch of bits with it. And then I took it back to the national broadcaster, government funded broadcaster. And they sort of said, yes, we want to do it. And then it got stuck in development for a year. And then they said no. And then I went, you know what? I'm turning into a live show. So I turned into a live show. This national tour is selling thousands of tickets. People want to come and see it pandemic hit had to cancel the whole thing but i went back to the network and said i've got all this stuff and they couldn't book, <laughs> yeah, had nothing to got some content they got some content because you couldn't film anything i said i got it an hour's right. worth here and they went yep we'll take it and they took it back and, <laughs> you're getting desperate <laughs> and, hey timing's uh, everything yeah. and you know and it, and it's it's a, it's and that's probably five or six years to do that but ultimately they're really important wow. stories to tell and uh, my poor old dad you know he's got dementia and well, the first show that I did, he'd watched it. And every time I'd get up, we'd watch it again. And he'd never remember watching it. And there's one particular piece in the first series I made. We went back to the, my family home, which was oh, quite, wow. a, quite a nice, simple 1960s modernist home. Very simple. But this guy just sort of painted it yellow and expanded it. <laughs> and there's like, it was nothing left of my family home left. And oh. we're watching it and dad's crying and I'm crying. And he just, sort of, <laughs> he said to me, he said, just keep making films like that, son. 
And so that's been my mantra, you know, wow. that's what I do. Oh so, if they, so if they take a bit longer than other, other projects, you just got to keep at it, you know, because when well, they that, draw up, when they beautiful. drop, you know, they make an impact and, and um, all these things do, they, ex- you know, it doesn't matter whether you've got five people on your Facebook page or a hundred people, mm-hmm. or you're doing podcasts or whatever it is, all yeah. these things create an awareness it reminds people, it brings new people in. Like, oh, why is everyone excited about this stuff? Kids see modernist homes and love it. They, mm. yeah, or why is modernism <laughs> over? And here we are thinking it's yeah, just beginning. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah. No, and it never went away, frankly. So, it's, you know, there's always, right. there's a continual historical thread. And, and the it, furniture it, is going to continue to outlast <laughs> anything else that's been created since, you know, yeah. 85. Right? <laughs> like, I mean, that's just sort of average. I, DC, but I mean, in terms of uh, your taste, you know, like in Australia, we have this probably we would have a more slant towards European modernism rather than the uh, the American style mm. you know, in broad in broad terms. In terms broad of strokes. furniture, yeah. furniture, um, was that similar in Canada in, in the way that your what informs your taste? Uh, well, here in Montreal and for a large to a large extent, East Coast in Toronto, uh, the Scandinavian modern yeah. was king. Everybody, it was imported in by the literally by the boatload. Uh, so much so that a lot of local Still manufacturers is. started making furniture in the Scandinavian style. Um, American modern never really, I mean, beyond the obvious ones, beyond an Eames lounge or you know, sure. a tulip chair. Um, most of it was Scandinavian, and I think it sort of fit because we're looking at sort of this Nordic modern. Uh, mm. You think of like cold climates and. You know, sure. you go to Sweden, and you realize, oh, it's northern Canada. It's fireplace furniture, I like to call it. It's comfortable. Mm. You can sit mm. in front of it and get into a, a comfortable Danish modern chair. It's so much volume for so little mass. I kind of like that idea that they pair mm. back everything to the most beautiful, simple elements. And that found a, a very good home here in Canada. Uh, Montreal, in particular, had a lot of local manufacturers designing. And one of the things that, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the French Canadians didn't take to French modernism, but they certainly loved hmm. Italian modernism. Yeah. So a lot of manufacturers, Sinon is a, one of those manufacturers who brought in great Italian designers to design locally furniture lines. Uh, however, those designers, and I'm not speaking of all Italian designers of the period, had somewhat tremendous egos, and those egos went unchecked uh, in Canada. <laughs> so okay. a lot of the furniture they designed it's Bugs Bunny over the top. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so insane, like splayed gigantic legs that sort of would trip you if you walked around the sofa. Yeah, yeah, T- I mean, toe crunchers, to toe breakers, they call and it. There's so much of it, and they just went nuts. And you see yeah. those pieces still in the various furniture or dealers here, and you can you just you can't believe that ever got made in Canada. It is almost the antithesis of the sort of gray mantle of Canada, almost it's sort of this. Presbyterian sobriety that exists outside of Quebec anyway. Uh, in Canada, however, the West Coast, whether you get to British Columbia or Alberta, modernism really never found a foothold, strangely. I, I don't know why that is, except architecture. I mean, fl- flat roofs and, and water and, and snow don't really mix, no. right? <laughs> Essentially. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, that becomes problematic. Uh, Tim, are there any furniture makers historically in Australia that are you know, worthy of being on, on anyone's radar, you know, to, to import or anything really famous that sticks out to you? I mean, the, the one that's the, the hugest one is Grant Featherston and his wife, Mary, who's, who's still with us. Um, yeah, he, his furniture is fabulous and incredibly collectible. You know, they, lots of people were making really interesting furniture here. Um, sure. A lot of it's just really simple, really useful uh, uh, take on Scandinavian furniture. Then some of it's more interesting. Uh, Clement Meadmore, who ended up being a famous sculptor, um, moved to, to New York, I think it was. His early furniture is very collectible for that reason. I suppose there, there, there are people who are making furniture themselves or a lot of it. Sure, sure. There was just sort of lots of companies that people are very fond of, um, like Parker Furniture here or T.H. Brown or Chiswell, who would, who would make sideboards or buffets and sure. couches, and they were, they were hugely popular. There was a guy called Fred Lowen who who had a company called Tessa, and we had that growing up. And he designed some beautiful sling chairs that that were sold all mm. over the sold all over the world. Um, and then you know, it, New Zealand had a, an interest, interesting one because most of their furniture was locally made because of tariffs. 
And so, mm. so yeah, there's top, they, topical right now in Canada. <laughs> they couldn't, they, they never imported any furniture. So any of the furniture that was made there that looked like furniture that you'd see elsewhere, they designed it from books. Right. Wow. Uh, you see that a lot where people just go. And so everything's a little bit out of scale. You know, you just go up to this table and you look at it and you go, oh, it looks like something. And then you go, oh, the chair's <laughs> a bit bigger than it should because someone made right. it for that reason. They, yeah. they scaled it up just yeah, slightly, slightly off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, isolation plays a huge part in what happens. Um, and that's yeah. what makes sometimes the what what in both Australia and New Zealand was that people would, it was just kind of, you couldn't see this stuff. You couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't Google it. So sure. they were looking at things from magazines mm-hmm. and sometimes, you know, there was like a copy something from a photo that was like a small black and white scale photo from the 1930s. Right. Um, and we had, if you start looking around at this sort of uh, eight degrees of separation, you'll find that the Australian modernists all have some sort of fit in Europe or America. Each other. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like our great architects like Roy Grounds, he went to America in the 1920s. He's doing, he's designing sets for Hollywood. He falls in with Neutra and a whole bunch of other people and, sure. um, and people who went to, to, to London in, in, in the 1930s and 1940s wow. came, worked for great people and came back and um, designed things in that way. So like they, everyone in, it was, it was still a small world there in many ways. Yeah. You know, you'd have to, like, people have to get on a plane to go and take photos of things, to see things, yeah. um, to wow. be inspired. That's pretty, that's pretty incredible. I mean, it comes, sometimes it comes down to a group of people, right. And, and they all, and they all know each other. They say that about business, right. It's just a collection of people doing something, um, you know, in a, in a concerted way. Are there any, um, are there any woods, you know, native to Australia or New Zealand that were used or, or materials and furniture that you're seeing? Um, the Australian hardwoods, but a lot of them were still, the option was still using a lot of teak in those days. Teak, yeah. Um, which, okay. Okay. But now, and then they would use some Australian hardwoods, but you were more likely to see those, those timbers used in, in, in housing. But then we were still using a lot of what we call Oregon, but Douglas fir was huge for sure. a long period of time for um, making certain furniture here and, until it became, you know, too expensive um, yeah. for people it's, to use. It, it's funny the extensions of, you know, this, this interest you know, all of a sudden you, you go deep on wood one day, you go deep on, you, dip on the, you know, the shingles and, the- <laughs> and, and that stuff. So, the, I mean, the, yeah. the, the, the house that I'm broadcasting from now is, was designed in 1959 by this guy called Bill Baker. And mm-hmm. Bill, what happened here was we ended up with all these, all, all our architects ended up in the Air Force uh, during World War II. Huh. And so they all learned how to fly or they, you know, because they, they needed them to draw things or they thought they were technically inclined. And so Bill learned how to, Bill learned Bill learned how to be a pilot in World War Two, and then he came back and he started up his architecture practice, and he also was working for Qantas as a pilot uh, on the side as well. And right. so he he went to Japan and he went particularly to Los Angeles. And, yeah, and, that, and, and that would said, get you exposed to a lot of stuff, right? And, yeah. And so he came <laughs> back, and and that's why this house we're in looks like like it does for that reason. Wow. And um, and 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 he designed it in that sort of East Coast style, and um. And, and those sorts of, uh, and then, you know, someone walks past and they go, oh, I really like that. And then they get the builder to do it. And, um, <laughs> and I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of work on um, the history of Australian motels and the, yeah. uh, the motels That's are really book, fabulous. Right? Yeah. And, and, and they, wrote, yeah. And they, I mean, put something in here, if I may. A long time ago, I shared a photo and I love the wood paneling. I love the Danish style chair. I love the acoustic guitar in the corner. And I loved especially the arm water sideboard in the background. I couldn't credit the photo. And normally those days when I was running the MCM group on Facebook, I would never share a photo unless I knew the photographer. Sure. But that photo, so I'm going to use the Just too good, huh? I found it so engaging. (laughs) There was such a tranquility. The acoustic guitar in particular, I thought was something amazing. I thought this was such a peaceful looking, beautiful scene. And I actually captioned it. If anyone asked me why I love mid-century modern uh, architecture, look at this. And I only found out yesterday, looking up and uh, reading an interview with with uh, with you, Tim, that picture. It's your house. It's the Bill <laughs> <laughs> no way. It's the Bill Baker. Uh, yeah. uh, Look at that. I'm blushing. Uh, yeah. uh, it's such a beautiful home, and Thank and you. I saw the facade, and I'm going. It's really American looking, almost. Mm. It's a really mm. lot of American. Huh. And then when you say the architect went to L.A., 
you can definitely see it right there. Mm. And especially also the Japanese influence. So, yes. Yeah. And that mastery of tranquility almost, you know, scale and space and, and, and economy of space. It's just a great, great house. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's, and, and it's a, a, a modest house. It was originally a two bedroom house and now it's, mm. um, it's, a, they extended it in, in the early 1970s, but, you know, I, I moved in here by myself and now I've got, you know, mm. I've got a family here and two boys who, who have the joy of growing up in a modernist house, but it's, um, it's beautiful. Yeah. We, we were talking a bit about that. Now, how, how, how do you approach getting the children motivated but you know you can't oversell them, right? Because they could sniff it out, and 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 dad's all into this, you know, modernism architecture stuff. Is it is it cool for me to do, right? How, how do you plant those seeds so that it's sustainable for the for your for your children? You just, I mean, you surround them by interesting things. You know, today we'll go yeah. off to the art gallery, and um, when we travel, we go to all sorts of places, and you let you let that experience do its hard work. I mean, you know, classic Gen X people cry into their graves when their kids don't like Nirvana. Um, and <laughs> That's I, a good way to put it. <laughs> and and I, it's sort of like I, I, you can, all you can do is, is, is put the cards on the table and if they want to pick right. them up, they want to pick them up. And, right. you know, there are people who have lived in this house that I've met um, who haven't been affected by it at all. By it all. Um, the original son <laughs> came, came around one day and he'll look at, oh, that's where my head got caught in the balustrade, but, you know, my <laughs> birthday party and the fireman had to come over and that's right. what, that's mum and dad's workbench in there. And it, it becomes all that stuff and, and nothing about the architecture. <laughs> right. And then people who have seen also, you know, my accountant was sitting next to this woman in Melbourne, and, you know, at, at, at this function, he was talking about having a client in Sydney and the whereabouts, blah, blah, blah. It turns out that, you know, oh, I, I grew up in that house that Tim lives in now. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it in a magazine. They thought that wow. little of it. And the best one was the guy who lives around the corner grew up, lived here for a period of time when he was a kid. He remembers the house being dark. Now I've got a full, it's a glass box. <laughs> I don't know. I don't right. know how that could happen, but, or maybe he didn't come out of his bedroom. So it's, yeah, it, it, right. maybe there was a significant curtains yeah, up or yeah. something. And you know, like this was a house what I bought when I bought 15 years ago, no one was interested in buying. Wow. Yeah. Not, not, there was not another buyer. Wow. Yeah. Which was lucky for me and my family. And I mean, that, that's why we educate, right? So that yeah. the things that we ha we've we collected keep getting more valuable. No, just, it's right. Just, it's right. It's just, just, yeah. just kidding. Yeah. Um, I, I, going back to Matt about the house, um, are some of the stories that you're, you're sort of working through, you know, as a result of having a conversation with the, with the homeowners or, or with, you know, if it's a museum, for example, you know, the, the curators. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very much so. Um, and so the story just, the, the show just gets added on by those experiences yeah. uh, of yeah. things. And when some houses are, we'll do, I'll do newer houses as well for shows. Um, yeah. This weekend I'm doing a, a, a modernist house in Brisbane that's, the architect had died a year ago. And so this is his family saying goodbye to the house. I've just sold it. And so wow. that his work and what he did in Brisbane will inform a, a fair bit of that show. And then sure. there's, there's always something that fun, funny that happens at, in people's homes or, um, yeah. and people are so just kind. Let, let it happen. Yeah. Yeah. We did this. Um, we, we've probably done more, more work in, in the UK over the years than in America. Uh, um, those sort of wonderful brutalist buildings in London, you know, so, you know Goldfinger, um, flats and, 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 and towers that we've performed in. And people are really great. You just email them or yeah. bring them up and say, or, or they'll come to one or someone will come to a show and say, oh, I'd really love to, do you want to come and do a show in my house? Go, yeah, that'd be amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People really no, like. it's a, it's such a, it's a unique community in that mm. respect. Um, you know, I, I have, uh, I have some thoughts about uh, like an app, right. Where, where you could start to discover, you know, places that are local. And then I'm curious if, if somehow all these modernist homes get listed somewhere controlled, obviously, you know, does that turn into, Hey, why don't you come do a tour of my house? Right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And, and we'll, you know, you know, pay you five bucks for it or, you know, come over and have a little, uh, you know, soiree. Um, yeah, well, people, you know, but because people want to talk about their interests. Oh, they do. And people are house proud and they love it. And they go, oh, come and have a look at it. And, I, I, can't, and I get too many people emailing me, to be honest, saying, oh, come and stay at my house. I go, okay, maybe not stay. Yeah, but, let's, yeah. try, let's try the line. I don't, I don't quite want the Hilton in Palm Springs, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not staying at your house yeah, either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
No, I, I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things I found you know, both in radio and in, in probably what you're doing when you're developing some of these, in all of these shows and the content, it, it's improv to an extent. Um, has that been a craft that you have really focused on? Is that, you know, repetition and just getting yourself out there? Um, I mean, I've been performing professionally for 30 years, I suppose now, maybe sure. no, almost. Um, so, you know, sooner or later you do get pretty good at it. Yeah. <laughs> and you get, <laughs> yeah, you do. Um, you do. <laughs> and I also pick the, the, the thing with performing the, the best, the easiest gigs you can ever do are the ones where there's hundreds of people because they make it, there's a, there's a noise. It's almost impossible from a stand-up comedian's point of view. It's almost impossible to die on stage in front of a thousand people. Sure. There will always sure. be a hundred. Someone's going to laugh, you know, um, no, but, that's good to know. <laughs> but getting in a room of sometimes 20, 30, 40, 50 people, mm. um, can, can be confronting for everyone. So how do you yeah. make everyone feel comfortable? Cause I turn up, I don't know how this is really going to work. You know, you come into a house, you walk around, have a drink. Then someone says, "Yeah, I was, I was curious. I mean, come, <laughs> you know, that's why, that's why I'm, I'm kind I of come and sit down. So, so, um, depending on where we are, like at the, the, the most recent shows I've been doing in a newish house at the beach here, people come in and have a drink maybe, and we'll have a little caterer there. So you can have something to eat. Um, and then the house looks as it is. And then we quickly put up, put all the stools in to watch the shows. Um, sure. Sometimes we'll preset them for whatever reason. Um, yeah, I'm sure. And then you have a little layout. break, and then you have a little have a little break. And some some owners will have let you have, look at everything and go in everywhere. Some of them will say, you know, I don't want you to go in my bedrooms and um, and and all. And but most people who come, are, in fact, everyone who comes, are really respectful. Um, yeah. They're really excited. But it's not for everyone. Um, you know, I've done it in my house, and I probably won't do it again because it's people, <laughs> right. people look at what you've done or, or your house and go oh it's small oh i don't like this right. you know people, well, i know how the facebook comments go so i can only imagine yeah, it's, you like, know. It's, it's like that in real life <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and i'm sure you know you're you're probably people would m might recognize you right but you know you you don't actually know you probably know the owner who's walking around yeah, you know you when you're know. performing but some people might not know who that is nah. and uh, i'm sure i'm sure there's some funny funny interactions uh, i mean there's, so there was this one where um this woman who was so excited about having us in her house. And then just before we were about to perform in a lounge room, it's quite intimate. It was about 30 people. She went, yeah. she went completely white and she was like shaking. And I thought someone had said something to her. Someone had stolen something or something. I right. said, is everything okay? You know, she goes, don't worry about it. I'll tell you about it after the show. So we did the show. Everything was fine. And sure. uh, she's there. She walks away from her husband. And I said, what's going on? What happened? She goes, oh, you wouldn't believe it. There was a guy here this afternoon in the audience who I haven't seen since I had a threesome in a spa with him in the nineties. <laughs> no way. It's like, oh, hi. good to see you, Bubbles. You know. Wow. And I, I don't know who I don't know who was more shocked, her or the guy. Uh, um, right. I didn't recognize yeah. you with clothes on. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So, I didn't when I when I brought up interactions that no. that far surpassed what I no. expected uh, could it could have happened. <laughs> That's so pretty good. How was uh, how was the version at the at the Opera House? Oh, I mean, I, the Opera House is is my favorite building, and mm. um, it's it's being able to perform there and be there and walk backstage. Um, is uh, one of the great joys in life. You know, it's a place where I've seen, you know, everyone from craft work to bird baccarat, you know, like it's sure. um, awesome. Yeah. And it, it, it is a, um, it, it's it, it, as a, as a symbol of nation making um, it, it, it is our, it's our calling card to the world. It yeah. should say to yeah. the world that we are a, progressive society that loves the arts and believe in the arts and we can, we're, we're brave enough. And of course it came with a shit storm and um, to make it and um, it, it wouldn't happen today. They wouldn't, it wouldn't yeah, happen. Yeah. But um, you know, enough I, people I really, cared. I didn't know the background about, about it being a design contest. And, you know, it sounds like they're, you know, manufacturer, you know, construction wise, there was some, some drama, but was Aero Saarinen was, yeah, it was um, on, like on on the judging board. Yeah, and I think the stock could be wrong, but yeah, and like the the Utsun design had been discarded, I think, and then he came up and he, he went, "What about this one?" 
Oh, and wow. um, they went, yeah. And, and then the uh, Urson's design was, uh, it, it wasn't, it was, it's tricky. Um, and it was cost, <laughs> it was taken too much time. The and, and the government of the day lost confidence in him. And he said, well, you know, threatened to quit. And they said, see you later. And then this guy, the local wow. government architect, Peter Hall, finished it off. And everyone was so critical of the building and it, it ruined his career um, personally. Really? And, um, and he got he copped the blame for all of it, um, and and yes, it is different to the way that it was envisioned. But you know, Woodson had come back, and he's part of the design principles for the building. But to go back to it, yes, the the joy of being able to perform there on a number of occasions and and talk about and in in a and in a in a design forum rather than a straight, yeah. straight performance forum is is it's a building that. Um, it never fails to impress. Wow. It's a building that never fails to move you. Um, it's yeah. impossible to take a bad photo of it. Um, yeah, and like I run around it every Tuesday. Um, oh, cool! And I, I just, like I did this. Um, it's on my Instagram, but I was making this a, a video to to encourage people to come to New South Wales during the pandemic. Sure. You know, because we can't. Australia's locked itself out from the world, so we can't go anywhere, and we have to travel internally and it's been effective but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah but it's made it's made us weird um <laughs> we're all we're and, all and, weird we're doing this i mean we're, we're all weird right now <laughs> and so normally the opera house is covered with tourists you can sure. never you can like there are people just climbing off it and so um but because there's no international tourists around well i was doing this film and it was like um i was running past all these significant architectural buildings and I was like running up, I got to run up the opera house with no one else on it, like Rocky. And it was right. like, fabulous. Like I'll never like the perfect time. You either, yeah. either have to, you know, clear the joint for filming like your crowded house right. or um, wait for a pandemic to get the opera house steps to yourself. <laughs> that's, that's great. I mean, yeah, there, there's a, uh, again, a tranquility sometimes. Mm. And, and that's, that's great. That worked out. I am curious. I know you've mentioned this, uh, in, in one of the, the talks you gave, where would that modernism week in Australia be if you had your way? I mean, I'm sure you would be involved if it, if it happened, but, um, you know, what, what's that sort of that, that right sort of focused area to, to make that happen? Uh, uh, Canberra, our capital, which is sort of halfway between Melbourne and Sydney. And it was, it was designed by Walter Burley Griffin and it's a planned city. It's a bush city. Um, mm. And it has, and they're starting to get to destroy them. Um, this sort of one of the most sort of concentrated, um, I mean, a concentrated amount of you know mid-century modern Modernism. build. Yeah, very cool. Um, and the, you know, and like, like they're like monuments in the paddock, and uh, the way that they weave into the landscape, and you know, you got these great buildings with these wonderful gum trees around them that yeah. define us as who we are. Um, and we don't value it here, of course. Um, they're knocking <laughs> it's them. It's hard. We're, we're all trying to convince people they're that no, they're pay not, attention. They're knocking them down. And um, there's a guy I do a lot of work with. I've, made, I've, done a couple of ex, I've done a couple of exhibitions on him. I put him in one of my documentaries, a guy called John Andrews. Mm. And he was our first internationally sort of successful architect. Um, he did the um, Harvard Gunt Hall, um, you mm. know, did all those wonderful buildings in Canada like Scarborough College and the CN Tower. They're all, all of those buildings are heritage listed in, in North America. Everything is done here. They're getting knocked over or changed dramatically. Yeah. It's such We've a tragedy. Reservations come up a bit in yeah. our, our chats. Yeah. And uh, is that is that something that, that you could start? I mean, I, I do, I think about putting feelers out there. What real estate lawyers as a place to start are passionate about modernism. Yeah. You know, how, how do you get organized like that? Well, I mean, the, on this, on the sort of micro scale is that, yeah, every home we save is great. And that, that, that comes through all TV shows, articles, sure. Instagram, sure. you know, design literacy, you know, it, social media is great for that. The bigger ones are harder. Um, we just had, we had a win recently with a sort of um, 1960s office blocks that got heritage listed. There was a building that I had a, a lot to do with trying to save. It's a brutalist social housing building that mm. overlooks the opera house. The serious building, well worth serious a serious building. Yep, well worth a Google. Um, a really beautiful building. Um, and the and it, and it's once again it said something 
wonderful about the society that I suppose I grew up in and it doesn't exist here anymore was that we believed that everyone should have a, a view of the Harbour Bridge and where we cared about people. Mm. And so we, we, we campaigned on a lot of fronts. They started throwing everyone out. They, refu- they removed everyone from a whole suburb. So there's no social house, housing left in the city. And they moved everyone out to the outer suburbs. So some people campaigned on the social housing part of it, which was right. really important. My take was, was more about the building itself. Sure. Uh, I, I didn't think we were going to win the battle with the conservative government about holding on to it for social housing. And so what we did is we, we did a marketing campaign on the building. So, yeah. um, you know, the grassroots and I got this guy, um, Pete, who's uh, this brutal house on Twitter and Instagram, and he does these amazing mm. posters. He did uh, what's his most famous album cover, the primal screen, the big primal screen record. Um, he did all okay. your, fa- all your favorite records of the two thousands dance records and a really great cool. graphic designer. So I said, yeah, to Pete, yeah. said to Pete, said, can you just make me these posters? Um, I, I want to make this building an icon. And so he did the design work and we posted them all over the city. And so they were everywhere. So, you know, save our serious sort of turning it into an icon. And then then we have this, this huge festival here, you know, one of these light festivals, you know, to get people into the city in the middle of winter. So they light up all the buildings. So, so then one of the guys had this idea that we would hijack that. So they just went behind some lights and lit up the building one night. Wow. And suddenly it's part of this vivid festival. Yeah, and, and yeah. The, and the government's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I bet. It just became iconic, absolutely. And so then the other thing, like, wow. I suppose these are, I think, lessons that are learned from trying to save a building. Yeah. Is yeah. that I realise that you, you, people can't, you don't have to like it to, for it to stay. And so stop trying to win the battle of trying to make people to see something pretty when they perhaps won't. You can, sure. argue, you can argue with aesthetics, you can't argue with history. So you, history comes mm. up front. So you say, you might not like that building, but that's the only building like that in the city that looks like this. And it's the only building that signifies the first green ban. And the reason it creates is that in the 1970s, um, they were going to remove all the 19th century, 18th century buildings. Um, yeah. They're going to just demolish all these 200 plus year old <laughs> houses. So they put this green band in the union and put a green band in and it stopped the, 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 the just, and then, and as a result, the bit that they'd knocked over with, they built the serious, this, this sort of serious building, this, Got the brutalist building. Got it. Um, so, so, but get people to see it and, 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 and pro, protests are good, but they've never, they, they don't change people's minds in some way. Yeah, there's got to be some depth. There. Get, get, yeah, yeah. Get, get people to it. So we had this thing called Friday it's Storytelling. Night. Yeah, Friday night serious, right? And I would say, don't don't go to the pub for your Friday night drink. Come down, bring your friends and come down to the building. And so mm. people would come. We have hundreds of people on Friday nights coming down and there was no signs. It was just music and, you know, we'd buy beers for everyone. We'd cook Organic, a few yeah. sausages. And then people would bring people down and they'd see it and they'd look at it and go, wow, this building's beautiful. I've never, I've, I've never really thought about it or whatever. Or they'd hear right. the story or meet the people who lived in it. And then we knew, sadly, we knew that it was making inroads into the way that the government felt we were changing the public sentiment mm. about the building was that they put all these cyclone fences around it and, they, and it's public space, it's a public building, but they cordoned it off so we couldn't meet there anymore, which was one of the total acts of bastardry. Yeah. Well, that, then it, you know you're, you're getting yeah. through to somebody. Yeah. But anyway, so they sold the building um, and then thankfully someone who bought it hasn't demolished it and won't demolish it. They're adding to it, but it's not, but, but it becomes a place for the rich people to live. And the government sold it for $155 million and they just sold the penthouse one apartment for $35 million. Oh my so, so they gave it away. Oh, wow. It certainly goes against the original architectural intent. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'd say so. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful building. I know the building. I remember yeah. when you were campaigning for it. And mm. it is, it's, there's nothing else like it. I mean, yeah. uh, people often lump brutalism into that sort of socialist utilitarianism almost. Mm. But yeah. uh, no, it's totally unique. It's a unique building. I can't think of anything. I mean, here in Canada, we sort of like our brutalism. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. so much of the brutalism in Canada is heritage protection, whether it's Trenton yeah. or Russell or Habitat 67 for that matter. Yeah. And yeah, they're now protected buildings, they, part of the you know, cultural mosaic that is Canada. Um, so well, yeah. yeah, everyone does, you know, and you see, you see like the Barbican in, in, in London, you know, yeah. 
they realize that that is a building that people they just people just love it. It's a yeah. tourist attraction. And um, yeah, we go back to the modernism. We question is if we can start. People will go to places to see buildings. Yeah, mm-hmm. well done. And I think I think you quoted in Palm Springs they bring in something like forty million dollars during that week, or, oh, or you know, with, more than with all, all the revenue yeah. combined. I mean, that's that's incredible. That's incredible. It's going to keep growing. Yeah, yeah. Um, feeling the next modernism week is going to be a huge blowout because the pandemic has now stifled two of them. Um, mm. So you know, I have a feel, and I'm planning to be at the next one. So I've been invited down a few times to be on the mod squad um to work with them uh but through various whether it's breaking a foot once or i couldn't walk <laughs> um to the pandemic so i'm hoping you, you couldn't put an eames uh you know splint on or something yeah. dc and play play the part <laughs> no mate yeah i i i would imagine you would be, have always been a permanent fixture there it's uh it's 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 always good fun oh i try to stay out of the u.s <laughs> <laughs> one of my guilty pleasures I'm sad to see it's been over for a while now, but it's a place to call home. Um, I just, it's a soap opera, but I just, I like the characters and I kind of enjoyed it. And I remember because he, one of the principal characters got elected to the Australian parliament as a conservative uh, and was going to Canberra. Um, I might be mispronouncing that name, but, right. um, and I was so excited that they were going to go and they, they barely showed it. Oh. And, they, and they lived in a modern apartment, which is great. Like the couple lived in this great modern apartment, but they're not showing anything of the architecture. I figured, I guess their B team wasn't available that day. So, you know, so right. But, yeah, no, no, and not, not the biggest budget on that show. I must say I've never seen an episode, but uh, thank you for flying the flag for a place called home. Gosh. That's a good show. <laughs> it only lasts for four seasons, but, and, you know. I don't usually watch soap opera. I, I call it a soap opera, but it isn't. It's uh, you know, just a, well, they, a they, melodrama. They, so I think it was Marta. I think Marta Dusseldorp was in it. She was, yeah. Yeah. She's amazing, so, by the way. so Marta, you'll love this, DC. So Marta's uh, grandfather, Dick, worked with Harry Seidler. Oh, wow. And mm. so he was the developer of all the um, Australia, wow. Australia Square, um, which is a oh, huge wow. modernist building in Sydney, our first modernist skyscraper. And Harry designed a house for him. Oh, yeah, that's wild. Six degrees of modernism. And, and, so, and, and then, <laughs> yeah. and then, Mar- Marta was the narrator of the Harry Seidler documentary. Oh, okay. There Why you go. did Seidler decide that you needed a seven hundred meter ramp to get into your home? There's always that long. Not, not exactly. Uh, length, I but- think that was for. Was it always? I can't remember. That was for his mother as she was getting older. I think. Oh, so, okay. Was, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Function. It was an accessibility yeah. thing. It's either form yeah. or function, right? Yeah. Hopefully. Because I love yeah. if you could... I love that sort of slow walk up to the home. It's like mm. it's it's a gradual introduction yeah. to the entrance. Uh, I tend to over romanticize architecture. It's just my thing. I always yeah, try right. to find something that's I almost like I anthropomorphize a house quite a bit. I, I <laughs> yeah. look for the personality. Yeah. The door is not just the you know, the door is the eyes of the home. Come on. We're, right. We're the first thing well, we see. It is. And and if at very least the the architect has user experience in mind, and uh, I, I I would say I do the same, especially you know going to somebody's home or going to one of these more famous homes. I mean, you know, I, I've had the luxury of seeing Falling Water, um, mm-hmm. and that was just incredible. And the and the nooks and crannies and the the door that opens this way and the the shelves that are built in here. I mean, it, it really is. You know, it's almost confusing, but it really is ultimately functional. I like the stairs um, to nowhere. It, so, <laughs> right. Just walk down those stairs. Just, there's a tiny landing at the bottom and, yep. and just water. I mean, I yeah. guess it's meant to be contemplative. Or right. Pool. But Certainly. there's no place to sit. There's not enough space <laughs> at the bottom of the stairs to compare. Uh, uh, right, 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 right. I, I know what you're talking you walk about. Walk down the stairs, you stare at the water. And you can't go down in the spring because the lower steps are flooded. So it's because the water is right. in spring runoff. And, but I still think that's one of the like, beautifully superfluous architectural features of this oh, yeah. stare to nowhere. And I, I love architecture at surprises. I'm bringing it back to Australia and even New Zealand, where they sort of shed this notion, this British notion that all great architecture ended 200 years ago. So, you know, it has to look mm. fake, you know, whether it's right. Victorian or Edwardian or empire style, whatever, um, Italian art for that, for that matter. Yeah. And they sort of think, okay, that's the pinnacle. Everything else is sort of this dredge of whatever happened. So we peaked yeah. and now it's simply cookie cutter, whatever. 
And therefore, there's, especially in Britain, to get modernist houses, uh, heritage listed or grade two or grade one listed, is still an uphill battle despite yeah. the education. Australia went another way with it, it seems to my knowledge anyway, that there was a much more open uh, acceptance of modernism, modernist architecture, uh, but catered to the, you know, the Australian taste, which you don't see anywhere else. Uh, I can't compare it to anything. Yeah, there's influences, uh, as Tim already pointed out. There's always going to be influences internationally. You know, right. There's a cross-pollinization uh, when yeah. it comes to architecture. So, Tim, uh, back to uh, another thing. I have to – I've been it's been bugging me. I watched your talk in front of – now, forgive me if I don't remember the exact name, but the Australian Journalism Association? Oh, the Australian Press Club, yeah. Yes. Press Club. Now, first off, wonderful talk. Uh, Thank you. Very enlightening. Uh, I love that you bring it back to your childhood, that this is not something new. You didn't just stumble into the trend. It's something that's been there for a long time, and you've allowed to germinate into something incredibly uh, important as far as architecture and preservation goes. But that crowd, whenever they got to the crowd, mm. it's like you were talking to mannequins almost. They were, like, mm. they were surprised. Why is this guy talking to us? <laughs> <laughs> the Sometimes, yeah. Modern buildings? Mm. I don't know. I mean, normally it's politicians talk there and it's televised every week and um it's pretty dry sure. um and this particular lecture i did was they it's the architecture uh lecture that they do once a year and which was a delight to be asked to do it uh, probably yeah. the most nervous i've ever been doing a uh, doing a 40 minute or 30 minute talk or whatever it was um sure. live on national television um oh, that was, was live. live yeah oh, wow yeah um wow and, <laughs> and to a room where people like yeah they, yeah just, they, they go all the back. time and they're yeah. and they're drinking red wine and it's um it's 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 this pretty funny it sounds the press club it sounds very uh sophisticated but it's um it's it's like we have these things called rsls here it's like a little like poke event poker machine venues uh where you can get a cheap mm -hmm. meal it's sort of like a club like that so <laughs> Terrible carpet, and ding, 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 and the poke machines in the background. So it's nothing. It's not like some tr trendy men's club, but um, right, right. And and Canberra, because it was in Canberra, they there are people there who they they just want things. They want everything to change. And the saddest thing about this country is that we can we can we've got a blank canvas for great ideas, mm. uh, and then we can be progressive and we can do new things and we can create architecture in our own image. But then. We just want to keep updating everything. We want to show the world that we're we're not outdated, and we've always sure. done it. This is this sort of idea of our, our our complex about being isolated, and that that's and in Canberra, like if there's a building's fifty years old, people are embarrassed of it rather than seeing it for it, it for its beauty and yeah. for its hist its history and, and to celebrate it. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, indicative of that, that, that came up in that talk is somebody, if I understood this correctly, literally wanted to put a, a billboard on the opera house or some, some sort of advertisement. Is that true? Yeah. So they do, they do projections onto the opera house sales quite okay. often and um, for certain cultural events. Um, um, sure. Lots of indigenous movements and, and for all yeah, sorts of yeah. sorts of cultural reasons. Sure. Um, if and it's then, deserving, yeah, yeah. And then they had a they had a like a horse race and they wanted to put they wanted to put the numbers of the horses on it. And um, the opera house said no. And it became such a funeral. Um, sure. And the government intervened and because the government owns the opera house and made right. them and made them do it. And the Prime oh. Minister our Prime Minister said, well it's a it's a billboard. Of course we should <laughs> Show it off. Got it. Got it. And I and I I went on television on a you know sort of popular current affairs show, and never in my lifetime did I ha think I would have to go there and justify the importance of the Sydney Opera House, the most stunning building of the twentieth century, um, our world famous <laughs> building, and we just want to sully it as the home of the arts by you know putting some sort of crappy ad on the side of it, and it, it, right. it's like awful, just awful, and it and it broke our hearts, I think. Um, as a nation, we don't respect the building enough and we don't live up to its promise. You know, sure. we, we let that building down constantly. It, it should be, it sits there to remind us what we're capable of. We just let it down all the time. Yeah. I mean, well, look, you are, um, you, you're saying the right things and, and you're trying to bring that motivation, that energy. And I think the focus, uh, you know, in the right places. And I, I agree. I, I, I think, 
you know, letting that be the anchor and, and, you know, a source of national pride and, and celebrating, you know, the, the fact that it, it is really a modernist um, yeah. building in many cases is, it, it's gotta be the way to go. I got, I got one, one light question for you and then we can, uh, we can wrap it up. So, so during the, you know, comedy duo TV show, did you, did you get to play set designer at all? I did. Um, I did. I very did. Cool. I did. I did a show called Unplanned, uh, which is like a, a impro show. And uh, I, like I had, I had a bunch of books and I literally just got, I got all these photos and I gave it to the guy who was doing the set design. I said, I want, I want sure. this, I want this modernist house, like yeah. this sunken lounge. And so the sunken lounge is, oh, is based cool. on the, on the Miller house in a, in a strange sort of way. And then he took elements from everywhere. And of course everyone, sure. everyone thought it was like the Brady bunch house. And then <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> and then the de- strangely enough, that dude, the dude who played Greg Brady, whose name um, was out on tour doing something or other. He's on some promo tour. Okay. And I was, I was interviewing him on the radio and I said, Oh, can you come and do a, you know, guest spot on the TV show? And so sure. at the end of the show, we got him to knock on the door and it was Greg Brady turned up in the TV show, which is fun. Wow. That's great. Yeah. He, said, and he probably that's, wondered that's what he was great. doing at the Miller house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> well, he was a, he was a mean, nice guy. Really nice. Guy. That's awesome. Yeah. Any so so on that on that pursuit and sort of having you know had this uh, this conversation. Any tips or tricks? Um, you know, as it relates to radio, or, or um, you know, kind of trying to get to the next level here. I just got to. I mean, you just with anything, you know. This you just got to keep doing things. You got to yeah. do what you got to do what you love, and you just keep keep plugging away and. Mm-hmm. And not being scared to tell people about it, not being scared to, you know, ask people to come on things and you yeah. know, just, um, you know, like I, I think my, my, one of the things I talk about a lot, um, you know, meet, meeting people through over the years, you know, and uh, yeah. which I love, you know, and you know, lots of different people who like architecture or architects or fans. And I met, um, he was out here a couple of times. He used to come out a bit. Eames Demetrius, the grandson of Ranch, oh, yeah. Ranch Al Eames, a lovely guy. And I was having a cup of coffee with him in in Los Angeles when I was out on a trip, and uh, and he gave me, you know, one of his, one of, a book of um, the Eames quotes. And and I opened it up, and the first page I opened it up was the quote: um, "Take your pleasure seriously." And, mm. um, and then I realized, you know, that this is exactly what I do for a living now. I take yeah. my pleasure seriously, you know, like I, yeah. I give, I give the things I love the respect they deserve. You know, this idea that we all know people who used to play the guitar and don't play the guitar anymore. Like, Oh, I used to play sport or I used to do all these things. And our, our, yeah. our dirty secret is our jobs take up too much of our lives. So it's like, um, I always think it's so, so important is that what you love is more important than than anything else and so if you used to play the violin and you miss it you pick the violin up again if you want to do a podcast right. you you want to paint you want to write about architecture you want to design your own house or whatever it is that you love that that, that, that makes your heart sore yeah take take it seriously yeah we're starting to tim thank you you've been so generous with your time and your insight here we really appreciate it I will absolutely, uh, you know, message you for that Vimeo link. I want to see the full series and um, it's been so much fun. Thanks guys. It's been a hoot. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We'll do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Now we made it work. (laughs) Sure did. (laughs) Thank you so much for tuning in from all around the world. This was a masterclass and we learned not only about Tim's passion for architecture and design in Australia, but we have picked up a number of tips as we continue to refine our craft in production. Go follow Tim at Modernister on Instagram. And if you're in Australia, go and support him in one of his upcoming live shows. Until the next mid-century, thank you and good night or good morning.